the book of Acts. And today we are studying from the book of Acts chapter 20. Acts 22, Acts chapter 20 opens with the departure of Paul from Ephesus. And the interesting thing about the departure of Paul from Ephesus was because there was an opera that was created by a guy called Demetrius. Demetrius was a silversmith. And this guy created trouble for Paul because he thought that, or his own, by his own calculation, that Paul was getting too popular. And because Paul was getting too popular, the message of Paul was becoming too popular. And if best, Paul's message becomes so popular, and a lot of people decide to become Christians, he is going to lose his business. In the sense that he's a silversmith who was building the shrine of Diana. He was, a, he was building the silver shrine of Diana. And if no people don't serve Diana anymore, his business is gone. So the guy had a selfish interest to persecute or to, or to stir up trouble. But the Bible makes us to understand that as he's trying to stir the trouble, bringing people to the hall and doing all those things, eventually that, that trouble was silenced. So by the time you begin chapter 20 of Acts of the Apostles, the Bible makes us to understand that Paul now decided to leave and to visit all the regions of Asia at that time to encourage the church. Because in his heart, he had always want, you know, you know there has been a, a, a longing to go back to Jerusalem. And the Bible makes us understand that he wanted to be in Jerusalem before the day of Pentecost. So, he, 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 you know, <clears throat> he started visiting all this other region, trying to encourage him. By the time you get to verse 17 of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, the Bible tells us that he got to, <clears throat> he got, uh, he got to Miletus, and from there he sent for the elders of the church all throughout Ephesus. And when he called the elders together, he began to, you know, he began to encourage them. And the question that comes to mind is that why did he bring them together? Why was it important for Paul the Apostle to bring those guys, to bring all the elders of the church together? Number one reason why it was important for Paul to bring them together, you'll find it in verse number 25. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, reading from verse number 25, the Bible says, And indeed, and indeed now I know that you all, among, of, among whom I have, I, have, uh, I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. In other words, he brought them together to be able to bid them farewell. Because he knew that by the time he's heading to Jerusalem, every city that Paul the Apostle had been to since he started encouraging the churches, the revelation that has come out has already been very simple. You are going to Jerusalem and you are going to suffer a lot. And he knew that. And he knew that he may not be able to come back to them again. He knew that he may not be able to have the opportunity to be able to teach them all over again. So he brought them together to be able to beat them fire. Number two, why did Paul bring all the elders of the churches together? He brought them together to be able to remind them of his stewardship. If you read from verse number 18, the Bible said, Now know, you know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility and with, uh, and with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly from house to house. Basically, Paul the Apostle was saying to them, you know the stewardship, you know my activity, you know the things that I've done, you know that I'm a faithful minister. So he brought them together, number one, to remind them and say, I am leaving you, you may not see me again. But at the same time, I'm telling you that I am a faithful, I'm a faithful steward. In other words, I want you to emulate what I have done. The way that I've lived among you, the way that I've served among you, the way that I've preached among you, I want you to do exactly the same thing that I have done. And then number Number three, he brought them together to share with them that, that, that the persecution that awaits him. In other words, the voice of the Almighty God is telling Paul every city where he went to that he was going to suffer persecution. And Paul the Apostle wanted the elders to know that if you are, you know, I want you to understand that I'm going to suffer this thing. As a result of that suffering, I want you to be aware that as I head towards Jerusalem, he wanted them to know what that, what is traveling to Jerusalem mean. He wanted them to know that though he was persecuted, that will not stop him from fulfilling the words of the Almighty God. Verse number 22 of that Acts of the Apostles tells us. He said, and see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testify in every city, saying that chains and tribulation await you. In other words, this is what the Spirit of the Almighty God has been telling Paul everywhere he has been going. And Paul wanted the leaders to know 
that though I know that I'm going to suffer, though I know that chains and tribulation await me, one thing I want you to understand is that those things should not be a discouragement for us. It should not be a discouragement for you for not doing what you're supposed to do. It doesn't mean that you should run away when you know that there's a tr- when you know that there's trouble awaiting you. That was what Paul was trying to tell the leaders when he gathered them together. That he knew that they, they, are, they should be aware of the persecution that will come his way. Number four. Why did Paul bring them together? Paul brought the leaders together because if you read from verse number 24, he said, but none of you, none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to, of the, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, Paul gathered them together to let them know, I know I'm going to suffer. I know I'm going to face tribulation, but that does not stop me from fulfilling the cause that I've been given. He wanted them to be strengthened. He wanted them to be encouraged. He said that though trouble may come, Situation might not go the way you want it to go. The year might not, you know, the things might look very bleak. The condition might not be what you expect it to be. The plans may not pan out the way you want it to be. But he's saying that I brought you people together to encourage your faith. Because I am not discouraged. Because I am not afraid. I am, I am going. I, want, I, I don't want you to be sad or discouraged. So I brought you together to encourage and to strengthen your faith. To make sure that you keep your eyes on the focus, on the goal. Paul brought them together, number five. To remind them that they have a calling. The fact that a brother is going to suffer. The fact that I, Paul, will go to Jerusalem and I'll be put in chains. The fact that tribulation will come does not mean that your call has been changed. It does not mean that God's call upon your name, uh, upon your life has been, has been cancelled. It doesn't mean that God has changed his mind as to what he wants to do with you. He's reminding them of their own call. He said, for I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come among you. Yeah, sorry. Remember the day of their calling. Verse, uh, verse number 28. He said, therefore take heed to yourself. And to all the flocks among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. He's saying that, yes, I am going to suffer, but that doesn't mean you should not do what you're supposed to do. Things may not go right for me, but that doesn't mean that you should abandon your call for the word of God. The fact that I'm not, you know, the fact that I might, not be, I might not be in your mistake eh, does not mean that you should not do the work that God has called you to do. He said, take heed to yourself and to the flock among which, uh, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. In other words, God has committed people into your care. God has given you individuals that you are responsible for. He has put you as leaders over the church. He has given you as a minister over his people. And, they are, and Paul is saying that the fact that I am going to suffer does not mean that you don't take care of these people. It does not mean that you are not going to continue to minister to them. He said because Jesus Christ bought those individuals, bought those souls with his own blood. And because he did that, you have a responsibility. Paul brought them together to remind them of their calling. And then number six, Paul brought them together to warn them of what is about to happen. Because if you read from verse number 29, he said, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flocks, the flocks. Also from among yourself, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. In other words, he's saying that don't be surprised when things begin to fall apart. Don't be surprised when the church comes under persecution. Don't be surprised that the people that are going out, in and out with you, they will begin to say the things that are contrary to the word of God. He said, don't be surprised about all those things. Paul was trying to warn them. He brought them together to warn them of what is going to happen to them in the church. And then finally, Paul brought them together to give them a strategy for the future. To tell them that, hey, though all these things are happening, though I am bidding you farewell, though I am telling you what is going to be for me, though I am telling you, I'm reminding you of your calling. I'm reminding you of my own stewardship. I'm telling you of what is going to happen in the church. But there is a strategy for escape. That's what Paul is basically saying. That there's a strategy for escape. If you look at verse number 31, he said, Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn you, warn everyone, night and day with tears. In other words, I've been telling you these things. And if you continue to read down in that particular verse of the scripture, Paul began to give them a strategy that when you this time come, when this situation begins to show themselves, these are the things that you are supposed to do. Okay? Now in this chapter, what I want you to understand there is that it, can, you know, it reminds us that there comes a time when there is a need for a change. When an era will come and an era will end. You know, when a season will come and a season will end. 
If you look, the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis chapter 8, if you read from verse 22, the Bible says, it says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night will not cease. In other words, there is always going to be a cyclical motion. Some people will come and stay. Some people will leave. So time, some people will start a particular process. Others will continue that way or consider that process. The season will come and they will go. And this chapter of the book of Acts of the Apostle is a chapter that makes us to understand that the ministry of Paul the Apostle was beginning to come to an end. And Paul knew it. Okay? Paul knew that his ministry was moving into the closing phase. Paul understood that his time on the earth was getting close to coming to an end. And he wanted to make sure he prepares the next generation of leaders to be ready to take over. That was why he brought them together. He wanted them to be ready. That my own time is almost done. My own, there's, a, there's going to be a transition right now to a new era. And I want you to be ready. Number two, he wanted to encourage the elders and make sure that the next generation of leaders are not discouraged because of the things that they are seeing. Yes, we are moving into a new season. We are moving into a new era. Yes, things, terrible things have happened to the leadership. But I want you to remember, I don't want you to be discouraged. But I want, you, I want to encourage you to continue the journey. Even if, I, even if the journey, the road is coming to an end for me. That's why Paul the Apostle brought them together. Number three, he, they wanted to make sure that they stay focused and keep their eyes on the ball and never lose sight. Because that happens. There's a tendency when you're moving from one era to the other. When we're moving from one year to the other. There's a tendency for us not to stay focused. There's a tendency for us, to, for our eyes to drop from the ball. Because we are pursuing other things. There's a tendency for us to lose sight of what is important. And Paul the Apostle said, no. Despite the fact that I'm leaving the stage. Yes, I am going to suffer persecution. Yes, tribulation will come unto me when I get to Jerusalem. But I don't want you to lose focus. I don't want you to lose sight of what is important. I want you to stay focused on what, the, what Christ died for. The souls that Christ has given unto your care. I want you to stay focused on that. And then finally he wanted them to make, he wanted to make sure that he equipped them so that they have the strategy for success. So that they know how to move forward into that new era. Now why is this important for Paul to do this? Why was it important for Paul to bring these people together and to equip them and to make sure that they keep their eyes on the ball and to make sure that they are not discouraged and to make sure he prepares them for the next generation? Why was it important? Because Paul understands that if you are moving into a new phase, if you are moving into a new year, if you are moving into a new era, the survival of the church is a function of the readiness of the people. If you are going to survive, if you are going to make an impact in the new era, the, so the, the readiness of the people is very important. That's why Paul brought them together. Number two, the success of the church in the new era is a function of their preparation. And their preparation is a function of their own readiness. That's Paul understood that. And Paul knew how well the church will do in the new era without his presence. How, church, how well the church will survive when he is gone. is a function of them having a workable strategy, a workable plan. Because if they don't have a strategy, they are going to be dispersed. They are going to be all over the place. And they will not be able to survive it. Paul understood that. And that was why he brought all the elders together and gave them a strategy for surviving the new era. And the same thing applies to you, the same thing applies to me, the same thing applies to our families, the same thing applies to the church. There may be those of us who are concerned as to what this new year will hold for us. There are those who are concerned because of the turmoil in our political system, what will happen in our place of work, what will happen to our economy, what will happen to our finances, what will happen to our healthcare plan or whatever plan that we are looking at. There are so many people who are not sure how they are going to navigate the waters of this particular new year. But we need to remember just like Paul was remembering the, reminding the elders in the, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the churches in those days, you need to remember that our survival as individuals, your survival as a family, our survival as a church is a function of our own readiness in this new year. Because if you are not ready, you will find that opportunities will present themselves. But you may not be, you may not be properly positioned to take advantage of it. Number two, our success as individuals, our success as a family, our success as a church in this new year is a function of our preparation. How prepared are we spiritually? How prepared are we financially? How prepared are we in terms of our career? Why are we prepared to be able to take, take, opportunity, uh, take advantage of opportunity? How prepared are you because your, prepare, your success is a function of your preparation? 
And how well we do as individuals, our family as a church in this year is a function of how if we have a workable plan, a workable strategy. How do we plan to get from where we are to where we need to be? That is the question that Paul the Apostle was trying to get the elders of the church to think about. Do you have a strategy? Do you have a plan? Do you have a, a particular system, a particular uh, idea of how you are going to move from where you are to where you need to be? That is what the question is. Therefore, to successfully navigate this new year that we have just entered, we need to take the advice of Paul the Apostle that he gave to the leaders of the church at that particular time. And what was the strategy that Paul gave them? Number one strategy was that it was a strategy of realism. What is called a realistic strategy. Paul the Apostle said in verse number 29, he said, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you and not sparing the flocks. For uh, also from among you or among yourself, men will rise up speaking perverse things uh, to draw away the disciples after themselves. In other words, Paul the Apostle is saying, as you enter into this year, you need to have what is called a realistic view. A realistic view of your relationships. A realistic view of your financial position. A realistic view of your own ability. A realistic view of where you stand on things. Paul is saying, be realistic in your dealings. Be realistic in your relationship. Because if you close your eyes, because this is my brother. Or you close my eyes, you close your eyes, because this is the church. Or you close my, you close your eyes, because these are the people that you have always been doing business with. He said, you might end up being, you know, being sidetracked. You might end up, you know, being, you know, being blindsided. He said, because after you depart, when we move into this new era, he says, some will come among you, not sparing the flock. In other words, they don't care what will happen to you. They don't care whether they are going to rob you. They don't care the kind of relationship they have built in the past. The Bible says that even from among you, says some people will say things that are perverse. They will perverse things for the reason to be able to draw disciples onto themselves for their own personal gain. And Paul is saying, if you are going to survive in that particular era, you need to have a realistic strategy of life. You need to be realistic about the way you deal with people. You need to be realistic about the way you think, deal with yourself. Your own abilities, your own wisdom, your own capacity, your own position, your own leverage. You need to be realistic. Paul the Apostle is saying, number one strategy for surviving in the new era is to have what is called a realistic strategy. Look at things and be realistic about it. How far you are going to travel in this new year is a function of how well you look at the situation. They might tell you that there's a business opportunity out there, but is it realistic? They might tell you that things are going in a particular direction, but is it realistic? Take yourself, have a realistic, have a realistic strategy about life, about relationship, about your dealings, and then you have an opportunity to move forward. Number two, Paul says that not just a realistic strategy, you must also have what is called a watchful strategy. Look at verse number 31. He said, therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. In other words, he said, look at what is going on around you. Don't just do things because people are doing it. Don't, you know, don't, don't just jump into a particular business because everybody's jumping into it. Don't just be involved in a particular activity because other people are involved in it. He said, make sure that you are watchful. Look at the things properly. Analyze them properly before you put your hands into it. Paul is saying that if you are going to survive in a new era, it is not enough for you to be realistic, but you must be watchful. And you will remember our Lord Jesus Christ always told his disciples, he said, watch and then pray. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Because if you don't do that, there's a strong tendency that you might do things. That you are not supposed to be involved in. Number four, number three. What is the strategy for success that Paul the Apostle gave to the elders? He said, you must involve in what is called an entrusting strategy. And what does that mean? If you read from verse number 32, Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, reading from verse number 32, the Bible says, Now, so now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those. Who are sanctified. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying that if you are going to succeed in this new dispensation, you need to commit yourself to the Almighty God. He said, I commend you to God. In other words, I'm entrusting you to the Almighty God. In other words, for you to succeed, there is a need for you to entrust yourself to the hand of the Almighty God. And not just to his hand, but to his word. And why is Paul the Apostle saying it? He said, because number one, it is when you commit yourself to the Almighty God. It is when you commit yourself to his word. He said, that is when you are able to give... 
That is when you are able to build, you are being built up. That is what will build you up. That is what will give you your desired future. That is what will take you to that particular place that you are looking for. It is the word of the Almighty God. That's why the Bible says it is not by power, it is not by might, but by my spirit. It is the word of the Almighty God that makes the difference in the life of a man. And the person who is willing, and who is able, and who is determined to commit himself to that particular word and to that particular God is the one that stands a better chance. Because if you do it in your own power, in your own strength, in your own wisdom, through your own connection, through the people that you know, there are going to be disappointments. There is no assurance in the hands of a man. The Bible says, by the arm of the flesh shall no man prevail. If you think you can do it in your own wisdom, in your own power, with the people you know, you are sadly mistaken. And Paul the Apostle is saying, now that I'm about to get off the stage, now that a new era is about to come in, one of the ways in which you can succeed in this new dispensation that I'm talking about is to entrust yourself to the God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and to entrust yourself also to to his word. And we are saying the same thing as we enter into this new year. If you are going to make the best of this new year, entrust yourself to the Almighty God. Entrust your family to the Almighty God. Entrust the work of your hands to the Almighty God. Commit yourself to the Word of God. And you will see that the Lord Almighty will begin to put things in place. And then number four, or number five, or whatever number we are in right now, the next strategy that the Almighty God talks about is the engaging strategy. Paul the Apostle tells us in verse number 33, He said, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourself know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. In other words, Paul the Apostle is saying that you must be productively engaged if you are going to succeed in this new era. Gone are the days when you will sit down and fold your leg and expect somebody else to do it for you. Paul is saying you have to, if you are going to make a success of this new year, if you are going to make a success of this new era, you have to be involved. You have to be engaged. Spiritually, you have to be engaged. Socially, you have to be engaged. Financially, you have to be engaged. In every aspect of life, you have to be engaged. Because it is when you are engaged, that is when the Almighty God begin to begin, begin to walk through you. But Paul is saying if you stay back, then you have a problem. And then finally, he's saying that you have to be engaged in a strategy of generosity. In other words, you don't think about only yourself. Generosity is not only in terms of money. Generosity with time. Generosity with your talent. Generosity with the things that God has blessed you with. He's saying that when you give to other people, regardless of what it is that you give, he said that is when you are blessed. A generous life never lacks a good thing. And Paul is saying that if you are going to make the year the best year ever, if you are going to make this era, the era in which the word of God will flow into every nooks and cranny of this particular community, he said then you must live a stra- you must have a strategy of generosity. A strategy of giving of yourself. A strategy of not living unto yourself. A strategy of making sure that you are concerned about the less privileged. And if you look at verse number 35, he says, I have showed you all these things. uh, How that so... How that so laboring, you ought to support the weak and to remember the word of our Lord Jesus. How he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. In other words, Paul is saying, if you are going to make sure you get the best of of this new year, Make sure you think about somebody else. Live a life of generosity. Release some part of you to others. Let your life touch one or two other people. He said it doesn't make much sense if you live unto yourself. Because if you live unto yourself, you will die unto yourself. But when you begin to live unto others and you make your life to touch other people, you will find the richness that comes from it. And these were the strategies that Paul the Apostle gave to the elders. He said if you are going to survive, these are the things you need to do. The question this evening is not you know, is not what the year holds for you. Because every year holds a boatload of promises. Every year the Lord God Almighty has, embi- has, a, has built into it a lot of things for his own people. The question now is that do you have a strategy for pulling those things into your own life? The blessings are there, they are hanging. The blessings are there for the taking. The question is do you have a plan? For bringing them into your life, into your family, and into the church. Do you have a strategy for succeeding in the new year? That is the question. And the Lord God Almighty is giving us the opportunity. He's saying that you need to have a realistic strategy. You need to have a watchful strategy. You need to have an entrusting strategy, an engaging strategy, but most importantly, a strategy of generosity. 